Morning, everybody. Welcome to Christian Call Session, Becoming a Model-Driven Organization in Four Simple Steps. Christian focuses on designing, implementing, and maintaining data warehouses. He has experience in a number of different industries, including tourism, healthcare, and telecommunications, and has played a number of different roles, including his role as data modeler, developer, project manager, and support team lead. He's very interested in new developments in the data modeling area. He's been a part of our last couple data modeling zone events, and he organizes a local data modeling meetup group, a very popular group. I was a speaker in a recent offering, a really uh, very active, wonderful group. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Christian. Welcome, Christian. Thank you, Steve. I think we have to cover a lot of ground today, so we might as well get started. I'll talk about becoming a model-driven organization in four simple steps. If you have uh, any questions, I have understood that uh, Guy, who is running this thing, can forward them to me. So don't hesitate to ask questions during the presentation if you don't uh, understand the, uh, anything. So just uh, before we uh, dive in, uh, Steve already has introduced me very nicely, so I don't think I have to add much. My name is Christian Kaul. I'm based in uh, Munich, Germany. My company mascot is uh, this nice hippo. So if, if we have uh, time afterwards, or if we have uh, uh, time in the, in the chat, you can ask me about the story behind the hippo. And uh, as Steve said, I, I'm, I'm a data modeler, obviously. So let's see where this goes. What is this all about? What uh, would I be talking about today? There's a really nice quote by R. Buckminster Fuller, the, the architect. You might, might know him for his uh, unique Buckminster Fullerines. And this quote is really, basically, it's, it's a sums up what, what I, I'm outlining here. He says, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So what, what, the, what this means, you have, have a, a model of, of reality and you have to update that, that model of reality to change the actual reality. And I, I've taken this to, to heart. So what, what we, we will try to do with, with this model-driven organization is pretty much exactly that. Before we see uh, how uh, we can do that, uh, let's look at how many existing organizations uh, struggle, what, what they, they look like. Usually there's some kind of disconnect between uh, the conception understanding of the business, the business model, the IT system, both operational and, and analytic, and uh, the organizational structure. So there, there people are put in, in, in teams. There's a conceptual understanding of, of the organization, either explicit or implicit. There are all kinds of IT systems, both uh, bought and, and homegrown. And somehow they don't really fit together, which, which makes life quite hard for people working in data warehousing and analytics like many of us do. Data is distributed over a high number of non-integrated IT systems because they have been bought, uh, because they, they have been developed in isolation. This also, also means that data has been migrated, ha has to be migrated all over the place all the time because th there are some vendor-specific models and then you change vendor and you have to get the data from vendor A to vendor B. You often have manual interfaces between incompatible applications. A horrible case with real life implications is uh, the um, IT management uh, b behind the, uh, the ongoing COVID crisis. Uh, even, even in a seemingly advanced ca country li like Germany, there are all kinds of different uh, systems that still aren't really talking to each other with a lot of manual work involved. So this is really something that in most cases, it's just annoying, but in, in many Many surprisingly many cases it can uh, pretty much kill people. So this is really something that we, we should uh, think about how how to how to tackle. And another point, especially for Europeans, but increasingly for, for people in other corners of the world, GPR compliance is almost impossible as if you have uh, this kind of landscape because personal data is all over the place. You probably don't even know where all the personal data is. So this is really a, a mess, and you might want to get out of it, I guess. What you uh, want is probably something like this. You want your uh, business model, your conceptual understanding of, of the organization, the IT systems, org structure, everything closely aligned. 
you want a manageable number of IT systems that are integrated by a common model. So it doesn't have to be like one huge system. It doesn't have to be a, a huge SAP system, for example, that does everything, but it should be integrated by a common model. You want to avoid purely technically driven data migrations. It's fine if your conceptual understanding of the organization changes and you have to do some data changes because of that, but there shouldn't be data migrations just because uh, that uh, some changes on, on the vendor side or you, the, the vendor rises prices, you, you change vendor stuff like that. You don't want all these incompatible applications that need uh, manual interfaces that need Excel magic. And you, of course you want easy compliance with GDPR and, and other lo laws like that so that it's clear where the personal data is and it can be easily corrected, deleted, altered as necessary. So of course you want that true. Sure, you, you want that, but uh, how can you achieve it? You can achieve it by becoming w what we call a model-driven organization. And uh, to get there, there are four simple steps. You have to collect uh, interesting instances, which are examples of, of things going on in your organization. You need to agree on uh, common classifications, basically the buckets uh, to put these uh, things uh, into. And then uh, steps three and four are really, really simple because they are, can largely be automated. You generate a logical design from the, the common classification of interesting instances. You, you generate physical implementations from the logical design. So four simple steps isn't 100% accurate because steps three and four are really, really, really simple. So step one is, not, not that simple, but quite fun. And step two is probably, uh, as, as always, the, the hard part. But in combination, that's uh, still a really, si really simple way compared to what we usually do now. Most of you are experienced data modelers, so I guess you're uh, familiar with the uh, conceptual, logical, physical levels of data models. And if you want to put these four steps into the uh, well-known conceptual, logical, physical framework, then the interesting instances and common classifications fit into to the conceptual uh, level. The log logical model, of course, is the logical, and the physical implementations are, are physical. This can be an org chart. This can be all kinds of physical data stores on different systems uh, and so on. If you want to, to, to dig deeper, there's a nice book uh, from David Hay on achieving buzzword compliance, where he outlines the different kinds of data models and especially the different kinds of conceptual data models, which I think has been published with uh, Steve's company, if I'm not mistaken. So if you want to dig deeper on, on the terminology here, I can warmly recommend uh, David Hay's book. So what are the, the four simple steps? Let's look at step one first the interesting instances. What are the interesting instances? Uh, they are uh, temporal, possibly conflicting stories. People tell each other about how things happen in the organization. Think um, concrete examples of, of business processes. We'll use an uh, airline example later in, in the presentation. So, so what could be such a concrete example of a business process? It, it could be a, a person bu buying a plane ticket, getting getting on 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 a plane, fl flying to somewhere, which sounds a bit fantastical right right now for obvious reasons. But it's something that has happened in the past, and I'm pretty optimistic that it will happen in the future as well. Uh, this these interesting instances can be handled in various uh, different ways with various different tools. One approach that's close to my heart is uh, transitional modeling, which has been proposed by Lars Rombeck who also has spoken at, at past data modeling zones and is most famous for championing anchor modeling, I guess. I won't go in, into the depth of uh, tra transitional modeling, but uh, just to, to give, you, give you a glimpse, uh, let's look at, uh, at our airplane example. So what is transitional modeling? The elevator pitch is basically uh, what, what, I, what I just said. It has been invented by Lars Rembeck of anchor modeling fame. It can deal with conflicting, unreliable, varying inf information. And especially the, the conflicting and unreliable part is something that most existing approaches don't handle very well because they, they are usually uh, dealing with uh, a single set of facts as uh, one single truth and transitional modeling can handle all kinds of 
uh, conflicting stories, stories of varying uh, reliability. So this is uh, re really nice for the interesting instances because it's very well possible that different people or different departments have different views on, on the same business processes. And transition modeling can help you to document them and to, to uncover the, the differences instead of just papering over them. It has a very simple uh, notation, at least to the mathematician's eye, and uh, modeling approaches that you probably know, like data vault, anchor, or third normal form, can be considered special cases of transitional modeling. So let's look at the flight example that I promised. Uh, the basic building block of transitional modeling is something called a posit. A posit is basically a, a statement where, where you don't say, say that it's necessarily true. It's it's just a, just a statement that might be true or may, might be it might not be true. And the structure is as follows: you have an identifier, like like here 1953 or here 1986. You have some kind of role for, for the context that the uh, identifier appears in, for example, name or here customer vendor ticket. You have some, some value like here Deutsche Lufthansa or Christian Kaul. And you have uh, the appearance time. So when, when this thing is, is posited, basically. So for example, here we have something and it's it's posited that its, its name was Deutsche Lufthansa from 1954 onwards. So we can, in this case, safely assume it's uh, Deutsche Lufthansa, the airline. And we have something else where it's posited that its name was Christian Kaul from 1986 onwards, which obviously is me. And then there is uh, uh, a connection be between the two. There, there's me as the customer, there's Lufthansa as the vendor, and there's an airplane ticket uh, as a ticket, and I've I've bought uh, the, this ticket for argument's sake, because of course right now I don't really buy buy airline tickets, but hopefully will again in the future. And uh, the other building block of transitional modeling is the assertion. The assertion is basically that uh, someone says something about, about a posit. So the so the, there is an asserter that says something. There's the posit that's being said. There's a confidence value where the person says, okay, I think this posit is 100% true or it's absolutely not true or I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't care or I'm 50% sure. And that's the assertion time when, when, uh, when the uh, assertion is made. So in this example, it lo looks a bit uh, opaque, but it's actually fairly simple. There's a posit that says the departure gate uh, of, of the flight uh, from my ticket is G G23, and there's another posit that says the departure gate is G42. And uh, Lufthansa says uh, in in the in the in the morning of the day, day of of the flight they are 80% certain it will be gate 23. But then 15 minutes before the flight they are absolutely certain that it's not uh, gate 23, and they're absolutely certain that it it's gate 42. And why is that the case? Because the, the plane ha had to be uh, put on a, on a different gate and 15 minutes uh, before the flight, they are absolutely certain that this is the gate because they already have the, the, the people on, on the plane. So it's really hard to change gate at, at that point. And the, I, I don't say you have to use the, this approach, but I think it's really valuable to capture all, all these kinds of uh, possibly conflicting stories you have about what's going on in your organization in a, in a standard format. If there are any questions, you, you, you can uh, fetch them through, through via Guy. So if there aren't any, let's continue with step two, the common classifications. What are these? They are agreed upon classifications for things that are important uh, for the, uh, the organization. Think different buckets for different types of instances. And this is something that can be uh, hard, but uh, it, it's not as, as hard and not as time consuming as the uh, enterprise data models of old, because you don't have to boil the ocean. It's it's the just that people that are in, involved with a certain thing have to agree. So it's uh, the the consensus is, is more localized and involving a small number of people. So the people dealing with uh, employees have to agree if there's just 
one kind of employee or multiple kinds, but not uh, everybody in the organization, every every department, every team has has to, has to agree. And it's also something that, that can change over time. It's not something that is uh, set in stone. If, if again the people working with employees, they find out, okay. Uh, our our tiny airline with, with with two planes is now a huge airline with hundreds of, of planes. Probably one type of employee is, isn't enough. We have to split into pilots, cabin crew, ground personnel, something like that. And again, if if you use transitional modeling, then you can do these common classifications using a schema by design approach. There's a nice article on that by Lars Rembeck that I can point you to if you're interested. Basically, schema by, by design takes a middle road between schema on read and schema on, on write. You just you st store store the uh, deposits and you store uh, the, the classifications, and the, then then people can can basically pick their their model. It's not that there's no model at all, and also not that there's one predefined model, but people can pick uh, the, their model. What does this look like? Schema by design. You probably haven't heard of it. The elevator pitch is pretty much again what it just said. Only impose the, the theoretical minimum structure at right time, just do the uh, uh, posits and assertions, provide enough meta information, enough classification information to create models and choose appropriate model at, at read time. So it's perfectly possible to, to have uh, one, one, one set of data and then two, three, four, five models depending on the different contexts of the, the different audiences. So what would this look like in the uh, airline example a class is a thing that can be used to classify other things and at read time the classes will, will be, become the entities of the model that, uh, that the consumer uses the use tables whatever so in in, in the, this in this case there's the possibility that uh, there, there's a class uh, passenger a class airline a class plane ticket so very very specific classes it's also possible that the classes are kind of generic, like party and, and agreement, and you you can have both uh, classification schemes at, at, at the at the same time. You you don't uh, necessarily have have to choose if you don't want to. And then there are classifiers, uh, which are uh, special posits that assign things to a certain class. So for so for example, uh, this is me, and you could assign me to the class passenger. This is Lufthansa. You could assign Lufthansa to the class airline. This is the, the plane ticket. You could assign it to the class plane ticket, or you could say, "Okay, I'm I'm a party. Lufthansa is a party. The plane ticket is is just some kind of agreement." And depending on on your preferences, you you could say, "Okay, I'm I'm say, saying this is the right classification," or I'm saying that is the right classification. So, for for example, Hans Halkrin, who is a data board person, and he's, he's very uh, specific and, and not abstract. He says, "Yeah, of course, Christian is, is a passenger. Lufthansa is an airline. The plane ticket is a plane ticket." But David C. Hay, he's he's more an abstract pattern kind of guy. He he wants things to to be generic. So he says, "No, no, no." Uh, Christian uh, is is a party. Lufthansa is a party. The the plane ticket is is an agreement. It's possible to uh, generate the different models out of this. So it's possible to generate uh, Hans Halkren's flight model, which is very specific from uh, Hans's assertions of classifiers, or it's possible to generate D David C. Hayes' uh, flight model based on his assertion of classifiers. And so uh, this posits here that that I'm, I'm, I'm the, the customer, Lufthansa is the vendor, this is, this is the, the ticket. And, and I've bought this ticket at, at this point in time can be modeled in a very different ways. So, so, it, so it could be a very specific model with the passenger airline plane ticket. Or it could be a very generic model with two, two parties coming to some kind of agreement. I'm not saying that you have to use this approach, but it's one that's really powerful because you, you can document all kinds of examples without necessarily agreeing on, on, on them, you can document all, all kinds of possible classifications without necessarily agreeing on them, and then you have everything there and, and, and can pick. You don't have to pick beforehand. But uh, but as I said before, it's it's perfectly possible to, to use different tools if they are already established in your organization, if people are more comfortable with them, whatever. 
so we we've managed to 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 get through the hard part now come the, come the uh, the easier parts step 3 logical design it's uh, pretty much uh, the, uh, the data models you know it it consists of concepts the uh, important things for your organization the connections we, the, yeah i'm sorry can we ask a quick question about the prior slide yeah sure yeah thank you this is from juha do you actually use transitional modeling with business experts when you're figuring out what's going on i would think most non-techie people would run away screaming from that not that it isn't a good way to document things yeah, you are definitely has has a point here. Uh, I'm I'm personally I'm 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 a fan of transitional modeling, and I think it's uh, good to to be used for for use cases like that. But m many people are not. So I'm I'm a mathematician by training, so maybe this has something to do with that. But many people aren't comfortable working directly with transitional modeling. This is true, and for for them, uh, a more graphical approach or uh, or an approach uh, like. Uh, Factual fact-based modeling that are that is more based on natural language uh, might, might be a better fit, definitely. That's interesting. I can see it maybe being also a input to a traditional data modeling tool, where a lot of the assertions could be fed in, and then you could create your the diagram. Yeah, so this is definitely definitely you has has a point here. If you're working directly with business expert, it might make sense to just use the transitional modeling as the backend, basically, and work with generated text or, or gra graphical models uh, when you talk to people, basically. Interesting. OK. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So let's see the logical design. Like like I just said, it's uh, it consists of the concepts, the connections between them, the details about them. So basically, uh, the, the attributes. And if you think about uh, a, tra a traditional relational da database, then you have the tables, the foreign keys between them, and uh, the columns of the tables. And this logical design is derived from the interesting instances using the common classifications in a pretty much automatic way. It should use use a highly normalized pattern to, to avoid any, any issues. This can be six normal form anchor style, where each uh, attribute basically is, is its own uh, entity. This can be a fifth, a fifth normal form, where, where you could put the, the attributes of, of one uh, one entity together. But it, it, should, it definitely should be highly normalized to, to avoid any issues. And then step four is pretty much com com completely automatic. If you have this highly normalized uh, logical model, then you can generate all kinds of physical implementations that you that you need for, for your organization. This can be a very, very physical real life application. The org chart, the organizational structure of, of, the, uh, of your organization, you can derive it from, from the logical de design uh, generating uh, basically small cross functional teams one to one with the concepts where each team is responsible for the details of the concept not just in practice but also for for storing them somewhere this doesn't mean that uh, every team should develop the, its its own data infrastructure it's perfectly fine and, and even recommended to uh, use a a, a a single technical platform like snowflake bigquery for for example so so that uh, the teams don't, don't waste uh, time and uh, mental capacity on uh, reinventing the wheel over and over again but still each team should be responsible for exactly the the data about the concept it's it's dealing with and uh, also be kind of forced to 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 in interact with, with uh, the teams uh, that are responsible for, for concepts that are connected to, to their concept for example, if we have a team there that's uh, responsible for, for the, the flights and the team that is responsible for the plane, plane tickets, then there's probably a, a connection be, between uh, the, the fl flight and, and the, the plane tickets of the people on, on the flight. And this is uh, documented in the model and there's a defined interface and the, 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 those teams have to work on these interfaces together, agree on what, what to do with, with, with the, the data. And usually one team is, is in, in the lead. 
in this case, it, it, it might it might be the, the flight team. In other cases, it, it might be it might be another team. But this is really this is uh, probably the, the the crucial point of of the this whole uh, approach. Uh, the organizational structure should be really 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 close to the conceptual understanding and to the uh, physical implementation of where the, how the data is stored should follow from that. Because uh, I already mentioned that the, this in the Hoover chat here yesterday. What usually happens is that there is some kind of understanding of what's what's go going on in the organization, what are the important concepts, how how they are relating to each other, and then there's an organizational structure where people are put into teams that don't reflect that. And so, teams are do doing parallel work. It's not clear who's responsible for what. It's not clear who's responsible for the data about what. I've see, seen this many times in different organizations. I guess most of you have too. So this is really the crucial point. Uh, your org chart should be very, very closely related to, to your uh, logical data model. And this is something that's definitely hard to achieve. I've seen people go into that, uh, that direction. There are some organizations that follow similar approaches. Uh, data mesh is close to this, but but they don't don't go all, all the way. Uh, the approach used by a Chinese company called Hire, which, which is organized in, 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 in small uh, entities responsible for different topics, it goes in that direction. But uh, I've rarely seen this uh, implemented in, in practice completely. But this is really this is the, the, the crucial point. And uh, I'm uh talking to to various customers to, to nudge them and into that, that direction because, because i really think that, that this is uh, the, the way to avoid most uh, most of the issues that we outlined in the beginning and the other important part of, of physical implementation is, is of course uh, the physical data store or data stores and the uh physical da uh, implementations here ca can be derived from logical design using something called shape functions uh, again this is probably the math mathematician speaking here there's a surprisingly sim simple way to represent sh shapes in the logical de design uh, as as simple mathematical functions and the, then you you can can convert them into the physical implementation easily you don't have to use shape functions it's also fine to use some kind of rule based approach or gen generation tool but the the point is you you shouldn't manually create these physical data stores they, they should be generated in an automated uh, deterministic fashion from your logical data model and also as i've already hinted at each team is responsible for storing the the data about the instances of, of the concept or details the, the connections that, that are relevant to them in one and only one defined location and all these data stores are interoperable by, by design because they follow from the common, common logical design. So that, that, that it's, it's clear there's a defined connection between passenger and, and plane ticket or flight and plane or, or, or whatever. And as much as possible, applications are created on top of these data stores. Uh, there shouldn't be application-specific data models, application-specific uh, data stores. I think if, if you have uh, watched uh, Dave McComb's uh, presentation, he, he, he also goes very much in that direction. And he definitely has a point. Because if you look at what kind of, of applications are used in organizations, most of them are really, really simple CRUD style applications, if, if, if you look at them closely. So people are creating records. They are reading records. They're updating records. They're deleting records. And this is something that, that can, can be uh, developed in in house and pretty much generated for, from uh, uh, the the logical data model and the physical data data stores easily there are some cases where, where, the, where the logic is more complex or where there's some legal considerations involved so i've to talked to uh, people uh, thinking about, about this approach where, where they say nah, I, I like the approach and i think it it, it might work well in, in many, many cases but i'm hesitant to, to use it uh, where uh, tax authorities are involved, where financial reporting is, is involved. There I want, want to trust my, my uh, big, big vendor who has a lot of experience with this stuff and uh, who I can, can sue if anything goes wrong. So this is uh, something of, of a caveat. 
of course, I, I would prefer to, to have this implemented consistently all over the organizations, but there might be corners of the organization where for le legal reasons, for, for tax reasons, whatever, you might be uh, um, willing, willing or even forced to, to deviate from, from, from this a bit. But, but still, if most of your organization works like this, it's better than um, none of it works like this. So, so I, th I think it's, it's, it's fine to have some, some kind of deviation in some uh, edge cases. And so we, we, we've all, almost uh, have everything. We have uh, the four simple steps that are, in reality, of course, not, not all equally simple, but taken to, together, they uh, make your life very mu much e easier and aren't, aren't uh, more, more complicated than, than what's, what's going on in organizations right now with, with much worse results. Christian, we have yeah. a quick question here on the yeah. previous slide from Stephen Beckman. I'd love to see a practical slide or two on the automatic generation of the physical implementation mm -hmm. of the data stores. Yes, I, I uh, have, have some articles about that. I, don't don't have a, a slide ready, but uh, maybe we can can connect after, directly afterwards, and, and I can point you to the articles. Yeah, that sounds great. That sounds great. Also, another question from Juha, which is the organizational philosophy here sounds to me like it has echoes of the data mesh domain, the, the mm -hmm. data mesh domain team set up. Whatever that paradigm, I think this kind of an approach where we organize around data entities rather than systems is is pretty great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's pretty much uh, right. There, there are uh, a lot of similarities with the data mesh. Uh, I think data mesh is more technically driven and that does, doesn't go all, all the way to really generating the organization. Definitely similarities. And I think both approaches have been developed roughly at, at the same, same time. Interesting. So maybe this is really an idea <laughs> whose time has come. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Thanks, thanks for the questions too. Please keep them coming. Yeah, definitely. I I, th I think we, we we have a few more minutes for questions, uh, and uh, I really encourage you to, to to ask them. Great. So if if you put put together all all, all these uh, steps, you basically model your reality. You model the organization that you want to want to work in. You regularly document the interesting instances, these representative examples of what's going on in your organization. If you want to make structured changes to, to the organization because you see, okay, the, these examples, uh, they this is what, what we do every day and it doesn't 100% fit with, uh, with the, the model anymore, then you have to build consensus, regional consensus, not global consensus, to alter the relevant common classifications. And then the rest is basically auto automatic. You generate the logical de design, you generate uh, the, the org chart, you generate the data stores, and this is pretty much uh, everything automatic and then again you you're in, in sync so what, what what you're doing fits with your org structure fits with fits with your your physical data stores and this is really this is something that that uh is, is necessary to do uh again and again to to, to make sure that uh your organization uh, is really, 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 really alive and and uh, adapts its, itself to, to changing conditions in the, in the in the marketplace in your product portfolio, whatever. But if if you have this this approach where this this change is something commonplace and relatively painless, it's surprisingly easy for for your organization to to do these kind of changes much easier than in a traditional org, org structure where. Every change is, involves a lot, lot of management discussions and pay, painful relocations and so on. So you, you don't, don't, don't want that. You, you really want to make, make change small, incremental, and regular, so, so that, that your organization is always close to, to, to what, what, what's, what's going on in, in real life. And uh, there's never uh, the reason to, to make a make a, a big jump a, a big a big painful transformation because you have gotten so much out of sync with, with the real, realities of what you're doing and the realities of the marketplace and if we look at our wish list pretty, pretty much we, we have uh, checked all the boxes we now have a very close alignment between business model it systems and org structure and if uh, the alignment uh, wavers a little bit, then it's uh, quite easy to, to re restore complete alignment again. You have a manageable number of IT systems integrated by common model. Most of them should be really simple CRUD style 
generated uh, applications that, that work on the current model. You uh, don't have technically driven data migrations all the time. You don't have the all this manual interfacing because everything is integrated by by the uh, common uh, uh, lo logical model. And the, of course, GDPR compliance. So compliance with uh, the, this kind of legislation is really easy because it's it's obvious where each piece of personal data can be found. So you know if you you you, you need need uh, customer data or in this case passenger data, then there's the passenger team and they have have the data store and you will find the data there, and only there. Christian, we have another yeah. question. Yeah, sure. From Rena Henriksen, do you have some references to companies? Who have successfully harmonized the different data models by using this approach? To be very honest, I don't have references where, where uh, organizations have followed this approach completely yet. I'm 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 working on on some customs, and I hope to to have some uh, convincing references next time. But so, so far, I've I've seen people doing parts of it, but I. So far, I haven't uh, seen anyone go going all the way or I have, have been able to to make someone go all the way. Yeah, I've seen that. It's interesting. I've seen that too. I've seen, um, so Joe Selko uh, has written a really good book on the classifications part of it. So that's very interesting where he uh, standardizes on different classification values. And I think that that works really well. I've also seen the anchor modeling piece work really well. So it's kind of cool to put those put those together. Yeah, exactly. And uh, again, I, I hope I have have some uh, um, more and more impressive uh, success stories next time when we speak about this. I think probably one of the challenges too is probably going to be somewhere in the mapping where, where okay, so now that you have your six normal form anchor model, how do you map that into um, the different physical models? That must that that's probably a pretty large challenge too. Yeah, but uh, I, th I think that this, this ca can be uh, approached in, in, a, in a very generic, methodical way. So, so it shouldn't be that much of a challenge. I think uh, in ma most cases, the issue is if your organization has already existed for, for some time, of course, you have all kinds of existing IT systems. You have all kind of entrenched uh, organizational uh, structures, uh, pa power structures. And this to, to, to get from what what you have and transform to uh, the model driven organization it's really hard so uh, i th i think w w what i will try to focus on is really get to organizations that are rather young that are more more like like startups where there aren't as many established structures as many established systems and then it's 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 much easier to do something like that if your organization is of sufficient size and sufficient age it's really hard to, to do a really transformation funny. like that yeah yeah they're That's so it. entrenched in how they do things today yeah sure. yeah Exactly. Yeah. If, if you think about the uh, so-called HR transformations, which are much less radical than, than this, uh, they also often take a long time and, and don't succeed. It's just really, really hard if you have many people that have been working in, in, in a certain way for, for a long time to, to win, win them all over. <laughs> true, true. Another question, too, from Stephen Beckman. So do I understand correctly that the purpose is, is to move away from a microservices architecture? No, not necessarily. So I, I, I don't think uh, this uh, doesn't work with, with the microservice architecture. I, I think there are some some overlaps with domain driven design that that, that also works well with with microservices. I wouldn't say that it doesn't work with microservices. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's see. We are almost done. If you w want to know more about this, if you want to dig deeper about model driven organizations or transitional modeling or, or shape functions or, or anything that I've talked about, about today, there are some uh, presentations and articles from Lars Drumbeck on, on related topics. There are some uh, articles for, from um, myself on transitional modeling and many, many other topics. We've written a, a common article on the model driven organization for Kata magazine at the beginning of uh, 2020. And there's a one-day training available in English and German for, for myself if, if you if you want to dig much much deeper. I'm making this this presentation uh, available on on my website so that you can also click on these links and you, you can contact me in in Hoover during the conference or in LinkedIn afterwards. And if I understand it correctly, that this recording will also be made available to conference participants.
so that's that's pre pretty pretty much it if you have any any more questions i think we have a few more minutes left and as i said if there, there's a question that just comes up later or that is quite complicated and needs needs a long answer then contact me afterwards on on who were linkedin or, or wherever so we want to know more about the hippopotamus <laughs> This the story really goes back uh, 15 years or so, where, when I was was still, still a student and was was doing a lot of uh, Wikipedia work, mostly on, on German Wikipedia. And there was uh, th this woman who was working as a librarian uh, at the school in Hamburg, I think, and she she was writing all kinds of articles on famous animals, basically. And Oberish is probably a very famous animal because it's the first modern hippo in in Europe. Because there have been hippos in Europe in in the past, between the ice ages, there were like warm periods where hippos even lived in the in the Thames, and probably also the Romans brought some hippos to Europe for like circus games and so on. But this Obeish was the first uh, hippo in Europe in modern times. It was a present to Queen Victoria around 1850, and there's a great photograph that the, I, I re really uh, love, where the 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 hippo is in in front and it's just lying there and sleeping, and all kinds uh, of people are behind the hippo, behind bars, and it's look these poor people are are in prison and this hippo is happy and free. But of course, it's a question of perspective because the hippo is in a zoo in a zoo and very much not free. But it's really something that 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 makes you you think that there are different perspectives on things that the appearances can be deceiving. That's why I chose uh, Obaish as the, the mascot of my little company. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? So have you experimented with using a different kind of structure for transitional modeling too, like maybe using JSON or XML or other kinds of formats as well to get the same content, but in a different, slightly different format? Yeah, I've, I've experimented a bit with uh, JSON and also with YAML. And it's, uh, it's uh, definitely uh, possible. You. Uh, you don't get uh, the same expressiveness and the same small number of, of characters with this transitional modeling, but it's possible. And it might be more approachable to people that are already familiar with, with JSON or, or YAML. Interesting. And what and additional metadata as well. So in the, in the examples uh, you provided for transitional modeling, do you also sometimes provide additional metadata, like things like the definitions, you know, the, met, the meta information, mm -hmm. the formatting, that sort of stuff? Yes, you you definitely definitely can can do this. You can uh, here here we we just have uh, the classes defined with like the, this is an identifier, this is a name, but it's it's perfectly possible to also have descriptions, definitions, and so on. This has just been been simplified. You can add a, a rich set of descriptive metadata to, to transitional modeling if you want it. It just has been simplified for the sake of the presentation. Interesting, interesting. It's interesting. We we saw a presentation yesterday where. Um, Router and Roy went from the case talk modeling tool into ER Studio. I'm wondering if there's uh, macros available that can do something similar with transitional modeling that can automatically go from the format you have into maybe uh, the anchor modeling tool or to ER Studio or similar tools. So I know there's some some tooling that developed by by Lars Rembeck. There's Berkeley, the, the database for specifically for transitional modeling. I'm not not, a, not aware of automatic transformation tools, but I would assume that that uh, they can be implemented quite easily. Interesting. Great. Thank you very much, Christian. Any other questions for Christian? I think we still have, have a few minutes. So if if you you have anything right now, fire away. All right. All right, I think we are in great shape. So thank you very much, Christian, for the wonderful presentation. You're welcome. And uh... <laughs> if there's anything else uh, you, you need from me, just, just contact me in, in Uber or LinkedIn. Yeah, you know, I'm really uh, was, uh, let's see, I think, um, Guy, are we all here?